to starting the LinkedIn, starting the webinar, and people are going to be rolling in, and then we're going to go to the and we're going to go to the uh, the feed. All right. Perfect. Let's see uh, this and that. Hi, everybody. It looks like we've got some people starting to jump in as attendees into today's webinar session with Tropic. I am really excited. Uh, we've got some amazing news from the CEOs, uh, uh, from the desk of the CEO as well. And uh, Jordania will tell us a little bit about that as well. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. As always, uh, Tina is in the background and monitoring. As you know, we do a live Zoom meeting so that we can engage with attendees here and talk about chat. Everybody who's jumping in on the chat today, feel free to jump in on the chat and tell us where you're from, say hello. Super excited to talk to you about how to turn procurement into a growth driver. Uh, this is a huge topic for procurement people, so we should get a lot of engagement out of this. Uh, a lot of people are trying to go from tactical to strategic. This is one that says, hey, how does procurement actually support a company and move forward? And we'll talk a little bit about that and working at the speed of business. Um, so all the folks that are inside of the room can hit us up on chat. Uh, you can hit me on the Q&A uh, tab if you want down at the bottom of your screen, or you can just throw your questions into the chat. I tend to monitor the chat really well. Um, and then Tina, for everybody that's on LinkedIn, Tina, are we live on LinkedIn yet? We are. Awesome. So everybody that's on LinkedIn, welcome from around the world. Tina will be monitoring your questions on LinkedIn. And if she uh, sees questions that she wants to pull in, she'll pull them in and then she'll feed them to uh, Georgiania and I. Okay. Uh, so that said, uh, welcome, Jordania. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I think I get it right, Jordania. Um, thank you very much for filling in uh, uh, on short notice. Uh, and representing Tropic today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us a lot about Tropic. I want to hear about Tropic. This is our first real engagement with Tropic. Tropic, for all of you that don't know yet, is the one of the newest permanent residence partners of Procurement Foundry. And we're super excited to be working with you because we know how much value you bring in the software as a service and software management space. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the company we'd love to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nice to meet everyone. My name is Jordana Greenberg. I head up our solutions team at Tropic. And as Michael said, I'm covering for Dave. Dave, if you're in the audience, hello. Um, but ultimately, for those that aren't familiar with Tropic, really what we are is a procurement as a service platform. And so I would think of us like as your turnkey procurement partner. Um, we're going to help companies automate all of their software procurement so that way we can save your team and your employees a ton of time and a, and a ton of money while doing so. Um, and I personally work with all of our customers to actually stand up a procurement arm or just create efficiencies in their existing procurement arm and, and really work through the complexities of how enter, you know, enter software has introduced new complexities to the purchasing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is this is something that I mean, this is exploding, right? I mean, it does. It's affecting huge companies, it's affecting small companies. It doesn't really matter where you are. Almost everything is software based now. And there is I mean, it's just you're getting inundated in requests for software and software management and especially SaaS management is becoming a major I don't want to call it a problem, but it's it's a thing, right? I mean, it's there everywhere we turn around. And it's not going away. If anything, it's growing in leaps and bounds every day, right? 100%. We joke about it, that software is eating the world, but um, it's actually true, right? You know, in today's world, it's a new discipline and it's impacting every employees, whether it's operationally in your actual day-to-day -day execution. And it's creating like really interesting problems for companies um, because in, in the world prior to software, right? Uh, employees really left purchasing to the procurement team and procurement was empowered to do so. Um, enter this new world, the shift to software, suddenly it's become really, really complicated. Um, and your key business stakeholders are playing a much larger role in software purchasing. And, and not even to mention the complexity that comes with software purchasing, given its access and integrations with data and PII. So there's a ton more risk associated with that. Um, so you just need more teams involved than ever before. And, and figuring out how do you actually adapt your procurement arm to to solve for that is, is quite challenging. Yeah, and that's before you even think about the fact that there's a massive community of companies out there that some element of software development is actually part of their business, right? Um, exactly. 
So, so when you think about all the technology firms or the firms that are reliant on technology-based solutions to provide their services now, um, it's amazing. I mean, you think about one of the one of the ways I think about it is, uh, and this this might be a good example is. So I've been driving cars for about 40 years now. Uh, I don't want to age myself, about 35. And um, this will be the first time in my lifetime that I have to take my car and I just scheduled this for next week for a software upgrade. Um, <laughs> so to think that, okay, now my, so my, my car manufacturer now has to be a technology company and all the different components of software that they have to buy to build the software to run my car it's like, wow, this just became an amazingly complex thing. Number one, to run your business, but also to quite candidly put a product out the door, right? I mean, th those are the two, those are two areas in which it's multifaceted. Absolutely. And, and especially, right, like software, it's not straightforward, right? The space is, is extremely, extremely crowded, right? There's a ton of options between there's different point solutions, tools, offerings, each have their own differences and similarities. And even just the question, you know, this customers come to us all the time and this is something I'm facing constantly is like, what's the right tool to pick? Um, and, and when you think about that and you think about how much time your key stakeholders who are tasked with growing your business, solving real business needs, the amount of time they're sinking into just like thinking about what tool should I buy? How do I then go about buying it? That's creating a ton of inefficiencies and even potentially slowing down a business by doing so. And so we call this actually at Entropic, we call this DIY procurement where you don't really have the right infrastructure in place to empower your stakeholders to buy software well. And that's what you know we're looking to solve and work with a ton of customers to, to ultimately solve. I love that. I've never heard that before, but I love DIY software procurement. Um, I'm, I'm, I love every time I do one of these, I get a new buzzword from somebody. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I'm, I'm going to steal it, but at the same time, I'm going to credit it to you as a DIY software, uh, sourcing. So let's take a minute and just talk about the current state. I know you talked a little bit about it already, but let's talk about the current state for most outfits that are walking into your front door and how they're currently buying and managing software right now. Right. So they're getting, they're getting hit with this from all different areas. Um, it's a bit of a mess, right? And it's not getting any better because of the magnitudes of, it's kind of like, okay, I've got a leaky boat and there's more water coming in every second. Um, so how are, how are companies in the current state right now, in your opinion, how are, they, how are they doing it? How are they handling it? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I would say most companies are trying to solve for and, and why they, they, they come candidly to talk with Tropic, right? It's because... What they're doing today, just by the sheer number of and volume of software uh, deals and, and purchases that are coming right. to their door, uh, a modern day procurement team is sort of has to end up divvying up the workload. Like what can they actually handle and, and manage in-house? There's there's naturally going to be some spend maybe over a certain contract threshold that they decide I'm not going to manage that on my own. It, it's not worth our time. And they allow employees to put that spend on their credit card. And then you have problems with shadow IT. You don't do the proper necessary risk reviews. And now you've exposed your business, both from a financial perspective and a security perspective, to a ton of risk that only gets exacerbated over time, right? Because once you introduce a, a software into a company, it's so much harder to rip and replace. Yeah. Your employees become, you know, really, um, they, they become dependent on it in a lot of ways. And then as you grow that team, more people need licenses and whatnot. Um, and there's a ton of factors that just contribute to these inefficiencies and, and make it really hard and messy to, to buy it well. So easy lead in for me. The next question literally on my list is what's contributing to this? What are the factors go. that are contributing to this explosion? Uh, I, know, I know in our pre-read, you talked a little bit about the cloud enablement of SAF, SaaS acquisition. And it's, it's now easier for, I mean, I, I, I know my, I remember the first time I felt cloud enabled software acquisition models getting out of hand. My nine-year-old son spent $300 on a phone app with his iPad when he was nine. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is out of control. And that is a micro example of what now has blossomed into basically the reason for Tropic, right? Which is, which is hey, this is getting real simple and real easy. So, so let's talk about some of, the, some of the things that are driving this right now. And I know cloud enablement is one of them, but there's some others, right? Yeah. I would say it's a, it's a couple of things. At first and foremost, I think it would be like information asymmetry, 
right? Um, the amount of times customers come to us and just ask like, are we getting a good deal on this agreement? Is this what I should be paying? Um, and when you take traditional procurement and you have that meet this sub subscription economy, this lack of land trans transparency is becoming more apparent than ever. Um, there's crazy price deviations that we're seeing between our customers for the same exact tool, the same quantities. Um, so I would say that's a, a big factor and that's very different than hardware, you know, software, it's, it's not clear what is fair pricing. Um, and then the second, I think, which is what you're alluding to, which is totally agree is, is this idea that business owners now became the buyers and they have the access to buy these tools on their own. And they're not considering the risk that comes with that, right? You can easily, as you're saying, sign up for tools for software online, you get a free account. Then suddenly that turns into a $5 paid account. Um, and all of these new tools are just flying under your radar. You, it starts innocently, right? There's no, the employee doesn't mean any harm by it, but before you know it, you have no protection from financial standpoint in terms of how do these licenses scale with us? And then similarly, I, I keep saying it, but a security perspective. How do you make sure we're not accidentally giving companies access to data and we're, we're protected on that front? Yeah, I love what you said about subscription economy. I think that's really, really interesting, right? Because subscription economy is everywhere, whether that's gym memberships or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, and subscription economy to me is uh, probably the biggest thing for me that makes me sleep, you know, as, as a 20 year veteran of procurement, the, the subscription economy in the click through terms and conditions that everybody is banging through, right? Uh, makes that. Um, I think also, uh, and, and I don't know, we talked about this a little bit in the pre-read, one of the other reasons or one of the other drivers that's out there is the changes in the dynamics of the workforce, right? So you've got a lot of people, they're not necessarily centralized anymore, they're decentralized. Um, and also the changes in uh, some, of the, some of the types of companies that are out there. I mean, again, back to that point where software is now critical to being a component of something physical like an automobile, but then you've got the true technology companies, you know, the web 3.0 companies or the software companies, even like yourself, right? Where you've got pools of engineers heavily dispersed around the world. All of that's also contributing to this and then layer over this subscription economy where we've just made it simple for people to swipe a card, push it through the T&E system and it creates just, just this maelstrom. Totally. I... I, you know, I actually had this conversation 35 minutes ago where uh, a customer said to me, you know, I, I feel very confident there's, this is what we think is our full list of tools, but there's definitely things on credit card that I am not privy to. And I have no idea where that is. And, and, and not to mention, right? Like part of that also is that these, your employees, the buying process is really complex, right? It's a team sport. You need to loop in finance, IT, legal, legal, infosec. There's so many different departments that get involved. Yeah. And it's hard for employees to know where to go, right? Like they right. end up referencing a wiki that might sometimes be outdated or it's so complex with the steps they need to take that it just feels simpler. Like no harm if I just sign up now, well, you know, it's harmless. Um, but there's a ton of ramifications from that. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about... Um... Let's talk a little bit about, and I know we're going to talk about price and, and pricing and billing issues a little bit further down the road, because it's one thing I want to talk about. Um, let's talk a little bit about the issues that this is all causing, right? Um, so I know that there's a lot of, the, 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 cause, the cause side of it is, is pretty simple now. We've kind of nailed that. The effect side of it, like, like what are some of the issues that this is causing inside of hyper growth companies or more traditional companies where they're like, okay... God, we're trying to get our arms around data and it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's even in the sub. So if it's a technology sourcing division, the subdivision of software spend, it used to be simple, right? I mean, we get one simple, everything was owned by IT. We got actual floppy disks. So I, God, I, God, I just dated myself. I'm sorry. We got CD-ROMs, right? Or downloadable disk or something. And, and now it's just, you know, click a button and off you go. And it's in completely different arenas. It used to all be on the on the desktop side. Now it's mobile. Now it's cloud based. There's no actual. You're just creating an instance on a cloud, and all of a sudden you're off the races uh, in an account. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the magnitude of some of the issues that this is causing for your corporations and your clients. 
Yeah, I mean, you kind of nailed the the most obvious one, which is one you're just overpaying for software, right? right. Uh, we yeah. actually saw internally with uh, with our customers that on average customers are paying around over thirty percent over what they should be on on software. Wow. Um, and like that's not even honestly the worst part of it in some instances, right? That's huge, and that could come from just either they're not paying fair pricing on both just like specific SKUs, or maybe they're buying tools that they don't need. Maybe they're buying two tools that do the same thing, or potentially, you know, if you have multiple contracts with the same supplier that are decentralized, there's a cost to not having those so aggregated and consolidated into to one agreement. Um, so definitely overpaying. But then also I would say we've actually noticed that even worse, right? There's decreased employee productivity that comes from, from not buying software well. Um, it impacts your, your revenue growth, right? It's distracting for stakeholders to spend time, right? You know, you need to buy a project management tool and there's hundreds of options in the space. Um, and there's decision paralysis that comes with that. And so people are spending way more time actually thinking about what should I buy? How do I actually go about then buying that rather than just doing what they're supposed to, which is growing the business. And so there's real, you know, long-term, I would say time um, effect, impacts from doing that. Yeah, I don't think people factor that into the equation as much as it probably is, right? Decreased yeah. employee productivity is massive. Um, and, I, and I like that you're seeing that and helping your clients with that um, and that, you know, people should be focusing on that as well. And I know that um, I, I can use collaboration platforms as an example, right? I mean, you can see it's almost like it's almost like looking out into that pond uh, when you're walking by in the summer and all of a sudden there's just an explosion of like, you know, flowers or something like that that happens in the pond it's like oh wait a minute there's a whole new business unit that just downloaded and installed slack as a collaboration platform it's like but the rest of the team over here is trying to work on teams it's like whoa who gave the okay for that who launched it maybe it's a geography thing you know what i mean but it's it's kind of explosions of pods and and i i remember back to a previous client from my consulting days i can remember them saying hey we'd like to buy a financial planning and analysis tool and i'm like that's fine but you already own six um, right. So, so, and, and it's, it's interesting, like you said, yes, there's a cost basis to that in the fact that you're duplicating the purchasing effort. And I love the fact that you said, number one, I don't even know if I'm buying this stuff, the right price. Right. So there's the, there's the, the knowledge that comes with organizations like yours, where you have the expertise of being able to benchmark whether they're getting it right. But then there's the duplication of purchases like, Hey, I just bought 20 licenses and oh, wait a minute, the guy over here has 60 licenses they're not using right now. We'll talk about asset management in a, in a second. But I love the idea that you, you just threw out, which is it probably, honestly, hard to track, but is probably the largest amount of spend, which is, and in, in is inhibiting what our topic is, which is being a growth driver, is the, the, the decreased employee productivity of, oh my God, now I got to learn another system, right? Or wait a minute, I thought we just bought Teams and I'm trying to learn Teams, but now you're giving me Slack and I got this and I got that from a collaboration and Coda and all these other things, right? Um, is, is that a, are you seeing clients come to you and saying, we have a major problem in employee manageability and time management because we're just inundating and flooding in because of, now I can, every single one of my employees can buy stuff. Yeah. Hundred percent, and and that was actually one of the biggest learnings we had. Like as a company, was you know, of course, as part of uh, Tropic, we actually guarantee savings, and so customers, you know, we expected when they first come to work with us, it's because look, here's incremental savings I could drive just by getting better and more fair pricing on my software agreements. But right. they're actually sticking with us because of the time savings piece, because we're helping them to one, make sure they can really understand the software landscape. Um, we're working with them to really understand what's the right tool to meet your needs. How can we consolidate where we can and, and find opportunities to, to really increase efficiencies in all of their employees day to day and just take it off their plate, right? The, the, modern, the modern end user, when they're going to buy something, they want, you know, Michael, we talked about this like Amazon-like experience, right? Like they right. want to be able to just hit click and buy and be done with it. Um, and that's not really possible or somewhat possible in the software world, but there's so much more behind the scenes that from a procurement standpoint, there needs to be more control. So you don't just have that one click buy online and have that shadow IT effect. So um, it's something 
every company is looking to solve for. Yeah, and I think I think what's really interesting, and you touched on it really quickly, uh, was the risk associated with all of this, right? I mean, we were talking about it. So a quick question I just want to go back to, a huge number. So you said that on average, you're helping, you're seeing clients uh, with opportunities as high as 30% in overpaying for software, right? Um, yep. And that's just, I'm assuming that's just at the unit cost price of not knowing what the right price is for the product right? Or not knowing what the right price is based on what the demand factor that they have is because it's a decentralized demand versus an aggregated visibility into a centralized demand. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. The buyer in today's world, um, you know, in software, the, the seller has way more control than the buyer does because of just the right. lack of transparency. And, and right. um, you know, this idea that data is just not accessible. People are constantly looking to us to be like, is this, is this good pricing? I'm not sure. Right. You ask your buddy, right heads up procurement at a different company, but yeah. still, even then your data set is so small. Um, it's, and it's something that we're looking to, to help sort of solve for is like, how do you build a democratized data set that gives customers and companies the information they need to buy software well um, and, and buy it smarter? Yeah. I think what's really interesting there is the 30% is actually on the ticket price of the software, but we just, we just had a really good discussion around um, the fact that decreased employee productivity is probably a huge number that nobody can put a number on, mm -hmm. right? So getting your SaaS management right is critical and it's an easy ROI calculation on the per unit price and the utilization and what we used to call back in the old days, shelfware, right? Um, yep. Software that you own that you don't use uh, essentially. But the decrease, the, one of the things that I think is, is, is under highlighted is the fact that using organizations like Tropic helps increase employee productivity, which is a growth driver because when your employees aren't focused on, hey, how do I learn a new piece of software or confused on how I buy it, they can be doing what their day job, which is coding out a new piece of functionality in your product or delivering something X, Y, Z, right? And that's how you make the linkage between, okay, if you get this right, procurement can be used as a growth, as a growth driver inside of your organization. Yeah. McKinsey actually just wrote an article about this and they coined this term for uh, software procurement at center of excellence. And how do you actually achieve that? And, and it's interesting because the whole article is about, right? Like it's not just the hard costs that come from doing so. Like they saw that with some of these major companies, you could see a actual significant increase in uh, percentage of your bottom line revenue, but not to mention then also just the time that's given back to employees. Um, and, that all, and that all plays into how do you actually grow your bottom line? And you could do that just by putting more emphasis on procurement and on the software procurement process. And if you nail it and you do it right, um, that has impacts across the entire company. I'm interested from the attendees that we have in the room right now, and, and I do this a lot, so just bear with me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw a question out to the attendees that are in the room and anybody on LinkedIn that's listening to us right now. Just give me a little bit of feedback on that. When you're calculating cost savings associated with services that optimize your uh, software portfolios, are you also potentially factoring the cost savings associated with regain time from employees on the fact that they don't have to go out and learn multiple systems and things like that. Uh, I'd be interested to know if anybody's been able to do that and how they're calculating it. It's probably a soft cost in your calculations, but are you representing that as part of the value proposition that procurement's bringing? Because if you're not, you're missing the boat, in my opinion, heavily on the value proposition of procurement to be a growth driver inside of your organization. The easy part here is the cost savings of using Georgiania and her company for things like, hey, I got to benchmark and make sure I'm getting this right. And oh, by the way, uh, and I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Jordan, I have a question around uh, uh, overpaying for software. Does that play out into geography as well? So do you see it in different currencies around the world? And are software firms actually, it's a great question for you because you might know the answer to this. Are software platforms now, which can now host and give you a pricing schema based on your geography, based on your IP address, are you seeing different regional price points across the world uh, based on software? And are you helping companies try and geolocate their purchasing as well? Yeah, I would definitely say that that's part of it. And it's also, I, I would say like another big part is just having 
um, exactly what you're saying, which is having the competitive intelligence to really understand the space, right? Um, and if you have the data to understand what you should be paying, how does different quantities, how does where you're located, how does this all play into software and, right. and your unit costs? Um, one, then you actually, you yourself have a competitive advantage, not just to get better pricing with the supplier, but it also enables uh, employees to want to come work with you, right? Because from an employee perspective, all they want is the ability to go to procurement and be able to get all their questions answered. Is this right. the right tool? Is this going to solve my true business need? Right. Um, so by having the access to the data, um, and then in addition, having sort of the, the automation and the resources behind that as well, that's really what's going to empower procurement orgs to really take back control over software purchasing and, and ensure that um, they're, they have real impact on the business. Let's talk a little bit. I, I know we talked about this in the walkthrough, and it's a, it's a question that I don't think has ever truly been answered. SaaS and software asset management. Where does that belong inside of the corporation today, in your opinion, based on the fact that this is what your company does for a living? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Because I would say some cases today, to an extent, it, it falls on the business owners more than a company would actually like. And so we really try to shift that and have it focus on the procurement pro professionals, the people that are the category experts that know and understand how to buy well. Um, and in order to do that, I, I kind of just alluded to it, but I, it, in our core belief there, you need three things, right? And we call it sort of software procurement infrastructure. You need the data, as we're saying, right? Um, right. You need the process automation, right? You need to give the consumer that Amazon-like experience where they can come in, request something, and behind the scenes, procurement is able and tools are able to navigate and take the necessary steps to ensure that you're checking all the boxes and you're buying this correctly um, and it's not conv convoluted. Um, and then the final piece is having the resources, right? Having the people at, in place to support the volume, right? Because with software, there's there's constantly a, a renewal, a new purchase that's coming at, at the door. And how do you make sure at no point, right? This concept of procurement is slowing us down. That's always con uh, most of our customers fear is that right. if we implement this, it's gonna, it's gonna hinder us. Well, in fact, it actually, can, if you do it correctly, do quite the opposite, right? It can actually propel and, and help grow the business if you if you set it up well. So, so the thought process there is, hey, we still want to try and be centralized in our governance and our strategies and our policies and our data collection, but we want to leverage that to be as transparent and, and, and educational as possible to our end users while giving them the ability to acquire it, but acquire it in in a, in, a, in a more intelligent manner that we can maintain, right? I mean, you don't want somebody going out there and saying, hey, I need another license of, I don't, I don't know, uh, uh, Atlassian, right? For a development team or something like that. And they don't realize that you've got a 30% or a 45% discount on Atlassian because of the centralized purchasing. You need some place where this all comes together and somebody helps to make sure that you're guiding that engineer while at the same time, making sure that you're not slowing down that project by three, four, five days with some cumbersome process that, that just exists because it's legacy. 100%, right? And, and for most, right, it's all about uh, value exchange, right? To right. Uh, a KPI we talk about a ton is employee adoption, right? Yeah. This only works as, as well as you can get your employees to actually want to participate. And in order to do that, you have to give them real value. And the truth is, right? Your CFO does not want to be speaking with a 22-year-old AE at a software uh, company trying to negotiate licenses and, and get better pricing. They, they have much bigger right. and, and other things to be focusing on. And so if you can offer them up that, that time back and you can give them the data to help them make the decision and make sure that you're doing it well, and then they get the benefits of that, right? They see that they're, they're onboarding their speed to, to using the tools that much faster. Um, if they feel like they're um, no longer have to deal with the mundane back and forth, the communication, all the administrative work, then all of a sudden, once you do that once, their likeliness to come and, and use the process is gonna be that much greater. Um, and you really need the right tools in place to do that. And, and that's what, you know, Tropic helps our company stand up. 
Yeah. So uh, Michelle says, uh, and I want to I want to go through some of the comments here. Michelle says employee adoption is huge and should be measured, right? Uh, absolutely yeah. no question about it, because employee adoption leads to governance. It leads to lack of shelfware. Um, you, you you negotiate from a position of, OK, we have X amount of employees and we're going to roll this thing out, which then helps you from a, procurement, a centralized procurement organization have leverage against the vendor population. Um, but then the last thing everybody wants to see is they go into the admin module of X, Y, and Z piece of software and they go, oh, wait a minute, only 17 people have logged in and I bought 50 licenses of this this year, right? On, a, on, a, on an app dev tool, that's $50,000 a seat, you know what I mean? Or, or a, 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 you know, a development kit, a, 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 what do they call it? I forget the three-letter acronym for development kits, but um, it's, and yeah, a perfect example. It's, it's demand management at its best, but orchestrated demand management across the Uh Question for you, um, are there are there areas? I mean, you, you kind of you're in a very unique position where you aggregate your clients' uh, knowledge and their usage and their software buying patterns uh, at Tropic, and obviously you leverage that position to help your clients through the savings and the cost optimization and the and the um, and efficiency gains. Are there specific pockets of software spend um, that are being misused, or like for example? Is MarTech just a train wreck versus MRO versus you know the development tools that we've been talking about with tech companies? Where are where should IT category managers, CPOs slash software category managers be thinking? Hey, I, this is a huge ocean for me. Where do I start? Where where are some hot spots that you're seeing from from your from your visibility? Yeah, I would say the the two categories or the departments that we see most spend generally comes from is is engineering and marketing. So uh, you're spot on with the marketing piece, um, but that's not to say that that's that's all of it, right? There's nowadays tools for every department, every purpose, and so how do you really wrangle? And and again, from a procurement standpoint, it's hard to really understand that there's thousands and thousands are. Our database, right? We have 2,000 plus suppliers in our database that just talk through the intricacies of each of them. What are features? What are their differences in feature offerings? How? Um, what is? What does pricing models look like and whatnot? And all of that's really critical to help navigate and, and make sure you're making the right recommendations to your employees. Are you throwing that down as far as risk risk uh, risk aversion as well? Like, are you starting to get into? I know it's cost basis and things like that, and certain licensing, and probably even threshold pricing. Like, hey, if you buy fifty, it gets to this. You know, if you buy a hundred, it gets to this. Right? The the Costco buy more ketchup model. Right? But um, what about like, you know, I, we talked and we touched base, and I, I this is the one that keeps me up at night. The click through terms and conditions. This is the one that really. Because for me, and what we're seeing in Procurement Foundry is risk mitigation is the second most talked about topic in Procurement Foundry. Cost management is actually fourth, believe it or not, uh, below supplier diversity inclusion in ESG and talent being number one. So for us, the risk mitigation as a community right now, although I'm thinking that with the current situation with inflation, it might be jumping up more. Risk mitigation is a big thing. So are you using your positioning in the marketplace to give uh, experience on that as well to say hey listen don't click through on this these are the terms we should go to a custom buy on this or something like that yeah yeah in our, our opinion like to an extent right for most software tools you do need to have the proper risk review or security review especially if it's a new tool you're adding to your right. stack um and in order to do that right you need to have some type of process automation that's Again, looping in the folks on your side who are who that's right, whether that's IT, information security, there's teams that are dedicated to just that, making sure that from a risk perspective, you all are protected. And so how do you make sure those folks get looped in at the right time? And, and actually, if you, you know, by setting up the right procurement process, you're benefiting those teams as well because they get to do their job. They're not slowing down the business at all by doing so. And now everyone's protected and, and the employee who wants the tool is happy because they're getting exactly what they need at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and we do that with our, with our platform um, through automation, right? It's all about when time comes, how do we make sure we're collecting the, the necessary security documentation from the suppliers? 
How do we make sure it gets into the hands of your, I, your InfoSec IT team early, right? It shouldn't be the day before you're signing and then all of a sudden there's panicked rush. Uh, so implementing that process with automation is really critical to that. So it doesn't slow things down. Yeah, I would think in a day and age when we have terms like the subscription economy, risk management kind of goes out the door when there's an engineering team that's up at three in the morning Pacific coast time and your procurement department is East coast based. And it's like, all right, they went, they left the office 12 hours ago and mm -hmm. they went to bed seven hours ago and your engineering coding team all of a sudden just needs something. And they're not thinking about the risk of click through terms and conditions, auto renewal clauses, uh, access rights uh, to, to, corporate data, you name it, right? Um, so so it, it's, it's really interesting to me that organizations like yours are leading the way in trying to help uh, organizations to uh, not slow it down to the point where you're a hindrance, but at the same time, creating uh, a system by which that happens uh, in parallel so that it gets to market faster and becomes that growth driver, right? Because one of the key things that I hear a lot now is, hey, listen, I can't slow down my business at the value proposition of saving money because we're a hyper growth company and I got to get the product out. Every day that we don't get the product out is a problem and we're, and we're a technology product, right? So, so again, back to that theory of being a growth driver versus an inhibitor, that, that, that rings true? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's something that we're always, we're looking to track, right? And, and automation isn't going anywhere, actually. Automation AI is like increasing in the space. And it's really important, right, to all of this, because at the end of the day, um, the more manual work that's required, whether that's on the procurement team, on your individual stakeholders, on your business owners, that that's what slows things down. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so taking that work off, creating a one place, like a stop and shop place for your employees to go to just really easily request something and then know that everything else that needs to happen behind the scenes is going to be happening automatically. That's how you don't slow things down and, and increase employee adoption simultaneously. Um, and that's really where you, you start to achieve uh, procurement excellence, software procurement excellence. I, I love talking to you because you're just leading me right through my progression of questions. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. I'm, I'm going to get to, I want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in success and what success looks like for some of your clients. Um, I did have a question before we jumped in though, and I'm going to go off script for a minute. So I hope I don't throw you that far. Um, yeah. I'm interested in knowing how many of your clients are coming to you in, in factoring in the diversity, inclusion, and ESG elements of their sourcing needs now. Right. So if they're coming to you and saying, hey, listen, we need to fix our software acquisition process. It's a total train wreck and we don't know how to get our arms around it. And by the way, you know, based on all the literature that we've been told, I can save 30 percent if I get this thing right. Right. I'm not calculating savings of employee time, uh, which is a soft. And I hear all of the people in the room saying it's a soft. It's a soft. I get that. But somebody in HR is going to want to know about it and somebody inside of those departments is going to want to know because they can reallocate those assets out to other projects. Um, so my question to you, back to the question around diversity and inclusion, are you starting to see clients factor in supply diversity and inclusion into the fact that they're trying to make that policy as part of the decision process? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it all goes back to the data piece, right? Because again, with that, yeah. If that's something you're really focused on, like a company's focused on, which exactly to your point is more and more, um, you how do you even begin finding the right tools that sort of meet those uh, standards that you're looking for, and right. and that you need the data for that, and and again, like if you were to just search all software, there's hundreds and thousands of different alternatives and options out there. So having a, a trusted source of truth that your proc procurement team can lean into is really critical um, to make sure that you're, you're limiting your, your search and, and your sourcing correctly early. So that way, again, sourcing doesn't slow things down throughout the entire process as well. Great. Great. I, I, I suspected that it was, but I wasn't really sure. And it's, I mean, I know we're talking about some of the one-off quick buy things, which tends to be the nature of this conversation, but it, it, it really is the bigger, chunkier buy stuff and being able to say, hey, I've bought, in the last year, I've bought 300 copies of this software with 300 people around the world. And, and, it, and it is, there's a, the reason why this gets really thick is because 
it becomes a billing and a payment issue as well, right? Like for example, those 300 purchases might be hidden somewhere in your American Express card T&E system. And the vendor says American Express or worse yet, the vendor says your employee because that's who you're reimbursing. That becomes a whole nother issue, which is, oh my God, my employee just bought this license and I'm reimbursing him. Who actually owns the license usage rights? Is it me as a corporation or them? But it's also creating a billing issue where in some cases you can't see the data because of what's happening. The, 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 the way in which it's happening is causing the effect of data divisibility, I guess, is, right? Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You need a platform that really acts as your single source of truth, right? Like no yeah. more with these wikis and going for certain purchases in different places, right? That creates complexity. And we hear that from a lot of our, our customers that yesterday's procurement tools that are out there they're not really built with the end user in mind to make it easy for them. And that's what like leads to this idea of putting spend in different places and potentially having multiple contracts with the same supplier. So if you create a platform that can really house and provide that visibility into all of your spend, that it creates that one place for your stakeholders to go to where they can easily just request what they need. Um, that's really going to streamline all of your efforts and, and give you the control back. Um, and that's exactly what Tropic's building for. Right, right. I uh, just want to take a note of time. We only have a few minutes left. If you've got questions for Jordania or the team at Tropic, please feel free to put them in the chat or put them in on LinkedIn. I know we've been covering a lot of stuff. Today. There's a bunch of nuggets here. I think you've created three new industry buzz terms that I'm going to be using in the future. So I really appreciate that. Just want to be cognitive of time and let's show, make sure everybody knows in case they have more questions. Um, I want to go back to, um, a, a, I know we talked a little bit about cost issues. We talked a little bit about strategies and policies uh, and obviously tools like yourself is what people are using to combat this issue. Um, how, how, do, how do people, I mean, one of the things here, and we just talked about that with end user community, right? One of the things is getting adoption and building those relationships so you get the adoption of the policies and the procedures on tools like yours that we're trying to deploy so we get the outcomes that we want. What are some of the wins? Like, what is success looking like with your clientele in that arena? How are they building those relationships? What are they seeing? How are they deploying? How, how, how do you, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll sum it up with, how does success look for your clients right now? Yeah. I would say it kind of circles back to something you were talking about earlier, but it's a couple ways, right? It's one, just the hard savings, right? Yep. That's success. Um, and then the other pieces is, is really exactly to what you're saying, like how much time um, is given back in employees day, right? How do you make sure that um, you're, you're being smarter about what you buy and who's getting looped in to do that? And, and I think more than ever, you know, there's been a shift where customers previously were really focused on growth at all costs. And now I think like due to the climate that we're in and, and the economy and whatnot, there's been a, a big shift to focus on profitability um, and, and really making sure that you're being efficient with your growth. Um, and so part of that, it goes back to this idea of like needing the automation and needing the checks and balances in place in order to do that. Um, and it, and it's complicated, right? It's, it's not straightforward. And so for our <coughs> customers, it's really having those, ensuring that with Tropic, we have those proper checks that we're doing the due diligence early. We're making sure that we're not buying tools that are duplicative, that you're second, you're ensuring that, again, all the necessary folks and stakeholders on their side are looped in for approval. And that at the end of the day, you're getting the best deal possible um, and that it's actually adding incremental value to the overall tech stack. And if we can achieve those things, um, which is exactly what Tropic's built to do, right? We have, we have the access to the data, we have uh, our platform, and then we also have the resources to ensure that you have 100% coverage across all of your contracts. That's, what, that's really where you get to that state of excellence. Um, which yeah. is what we're aiming for. I, I think that's huge, right? Being able to say, hey, listen, I've got, you know, I, I don't know what the number is of under management software tools and spend is right now out there in the world. I People are going to throw out ridiculously large numbers because they want to look really cool to their leadership teams. But I'm guessing that if we were to take uh, a, a, a real number 
uh, an unadulterated number of how much of the SaaS management is under actual management right now by some of the world. I, I think uh, I think it would be shocking how small the number is. I think you know world class organizations are not shooting for one hundred percent management because I think it's unrealistic to attain that. But I'm guessing it's probably somewhere in the eighty to ninety percent range is world class, all the way down to hey man we get a we get our arms wrapped around about twenty percent of this right. Um, really. on a good day. Um, so, so really interesting for me, I think you, you, you talked about hard savings, you talked about time management, we talked about risk reduction associated with making sure, um, and we talked about, you know, being able to make sure that, hey, we don't have, you know, dead software licenses, and also proving the value proposition for senior leadership and why they invest in organizations like yours. I got a question for you around insights um, from your unique for unique position. So you as a company are in a very unique position because you're aggregating usage. Do companies come to you and try to speed up the market research process from time to time and go, hey, listen, I need a project management tool for a development team that's multinational and works uh, follow the sun. What are you seeing your clients buy right now that's in my cost range of 10 to, I don't know, a hundred to five hundred dollars per user. Are you advising companies on things like that, or are you, like, what, what, what do you do? You play a role in that space? Yeah, all the time. Um, that's part of the value. Is like, you know, generally an employee knows what they want, but they don't know what are the suppliers they should be looking at, and so right. we can provide that data and insight. And then for us, what's what's even more fascinating, right, is that with companies where, where not only can we provide the data to our customers, but then also our services, right? So as part of this, right, we really believe that there's a hybrid approach to, to, in, to your resources and your people, right? right. Um, of course, for a lot of companies, procurement uh, folks are really focused on large strategic agreements and there's a natural tendency and it makes sense, right? Just based off of the time a procurement team has to sometimes um, allow smaller tail spends agreements to, uh, to right. go to the wayside. And so with Tropic, you know, something we can not only help with is give the data, but then also provide the resources where a team of procurement experts who specialize in software, and we can then actually help you actually buy those tools on your behalf, um, right. for, and focus on the ones that your team internally might not have bandwidth for. So it, it's sort of a, a marrying of the two. Yeah, it just makes sense that basically, essentially what you're doing is you're providing a, 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 a what I'll call a staff augmentation and a knowledge augmentation uh, service offering, which then accumulates into cost savings based on best practices that you are in a unique position to have, which, which, which again, and I hate to sound like a broken record here, but people who listen to, to Procurement Foundry all the time and listen to me, this is a buy versus build mentality, right? You're never going to be able to build out an organization fast enough to stay ahead of the curve on the explosion of software management inside of your organization. And if you think we're at the end of it, again, go back to the car thing, for example, my software update in my automobile is going to take three hours this week. It's going to take eight hours, two years from now, right? Because there's going to be even more diodes and more sensors and more things and, and it's going to get even more complicated with the numbers of individual pieces of software contributing to an automobile um so i love the fact that your organization provides you know knowledge and staff augmentation which is huge for procurement people uh either early on in their days which are in hyper growth technology firms who don't have the headcount abilities right but need somebody like you to be able to do this and at the same time you bring the knowledge expertise of being able to see the marketplace because of the the um, the sheer uh, the size of your your client population, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like fundamentally what we believe is that in order the the software purchasing infrastructure, you need the the data, you need the workflow automation, yeah. and then you need the team of experts that can handle the contracts that you just don't have time for candidly. And that's exactly what Tropic does for for our customers. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Um, so let me let me ask you this. We're, we're out of time. Uh, we're over time, which is great because I can talk about this for days. I, me so, too. <laughs> so, so, software spend and software management to me is critical to the success of almost every company on the planet now because software mm -hmm. is core to almost every product on the planet. Um, 
So let me ask you this. What is one takeaway, um, one takeaway that, that you would like to leave the audience with today? I mean, they're going to go back and they're going to listen to this again because there's a lot of nuggets in here. But what's one takeaway that you think people should take away if, if they had to take if just one thing they should take away? What's the key takeaway for today? Yeah, um, oof, that's a good one. I would say so no matter what you're looking to achieve, right? Like if you're looking to be more profitable, if you're looking to um, improve burn rate, accelerate growth, whatever it is, the, the thing that just holds true is that one software is not going anywhere um, and it's really hard to buy well. And, and I think with that, it's okay to ask for help. Um, it's okay, right, to realize that this is something that uh, requires uh, support, requires the tools and the data to do it. And if you do that, you actually can have real impact to your business's growth um, and your executive level's objectives. Yeah. I mean, this isn't something you can track in Excel anymore. Those days no. are over, right? Correct. Um, and, and even if you could, uh, the complexities of all of that and the, uh, the self-service Amazon style subscription economy models uh, that we've seen, I can tell, you can tell I like that because I've used it about six times. Uh, yeah. the, sus <laughs> the subscription economy lifestyle that's happening now in corporate and high growth companies uh, is certainly something that you're not going to be able to uh, offset. And I think one of the things you said in there, was, which is key, and I wrote it down, is it's okay to ask for help. Um, you, you're not going to be a subject matter expert in every piece of software that's out there on the planet, nor are you expected to be because there's thousands of pieces of software out there uh, and it continues to grow every day. Uh, and explode. Uh, Jordania, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. It's been very, very educational. Uh, I'm sorry that we went over time, but it's always good when we when we have a great topic to go over time. Um, how do people get in touch with you? Obviously, let's go back for a second. So the Tropic team in Jordania and the rest of the team, uh, they are now permanent residence partners of Procurement Foundry, and you will see them more and more uh, with different aspects of content and thought leadership. Uh, probably at our events and at our webinars and blog posts and other things we'll be doing uh, together. So thank you so much for sponsoring Procurement Foundry because it helps us to build one of the best communities that's out there for procurement and supply chain people. Um, how do people get in touch with you if they need to? Obviously, there's a website and things like that, right? They can just look yeah. you up. Yeah, exactly. I would say go to our website. If, if nothing else, you can request a free savings assessment where we'll just oh, cool. help run run to see what is the savings opportunity on your software stack. Um, you can also request a call with me directly. I'm more than happy to chat uh, and continue this conversation. I can talk about this forever. Um, and you know, just generally Tropic's happy to provide guidance in, in whatever way we can. That's a brilliant idea. I, I think, listen, if you're willing to offer free software savings assessment in my tail spend on stuff I'm not even looking at right now, exactly. I'd be all over that if I was in that space still. Uh, definitely a great takeaway and a great way to dip a toe in the water with organizations like Tropic and see if there's some value I add, add for you. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you much to the team. Thank you for everybody that listened and for the people that got engaged in the chat. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. It was great. Nice to meet everyone. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.